Let's begin. Um, if you will, turn with me to Luke 17. You guys already knew we were going there. And also, if you want to go ahead, if you have two ribbons or want to put a sheet of paper or whatever, mark Colossians chapter 2 because we're actually going to go to Colossians 2 twice. So Luke 17, Colossians 2. <clears throat> and I imagine you're probably expecting today that we're going to start in verse 20 and go through thir- verse 37 since that's the you know next major chunk of Scripture here if we see before another heading. Um, and, and you would be half right if you assume that. Uh, but in studying through this and looking at it, I quickly realized there is no way that we could do this section of Scripture any real justice in just one sermon. And so today, I, I've chosen to split it up, and today we're going to look at verses 20 through 25, and then next Sunday we will, we will pick up the rest and actually finish chapter 17. Um, and, and i got two things that I want to clarify from the outset here. And the first one is that this is a very, very eschatological portion of Scripture, meaning dealing with the doctrine of, of end times, last days, whatever you want to call it. And, and I just don't have time this morning to labor out the different viewpoints. So, you know, I, I'm not going to sit up here and say, well, the historicist would say this, whereas here's the preterist view and the idealist. We don't have time for all that. So what I'm going to do is simply teach this text the way that I'm convinced and convicted is the proper understanding of it. And if you hold a different viewpoint than me, then that's fine. We can agree to disagree. Um, so that's one. And secondly, what I want to show you before we get into the text is that this particular portion of text is a chiasm. It's called a chiasm. And if you're not familiar with that term, chiasm, this is a Hebrew literary style that was really, really popular back in the day in Bible times because this structure that they used made it really easy to memorize the teaching and learn the truths of what's being communicated. And here's how a chiasm works. Imagine with me that we were looking at six verses of Scripture, okay? Now, what we would do is essentially build a staircase with the first three, and then we would mirror that, and the next three would go back down, and they would correspond to one another, right? So each corresponding verse would parallel, or it would convey the same idea as the one beside it. So, for example, verse 1 would be point A. Verse 2 would be B. Verse 3 would be C. And now we would flip it and go back down. So equal with verse C would be verse D, right? And then you would go, um, sorry, I messed that up, CBA. Sorry, there is no D in there. So what you would have is ABC, CBA, and they would correspond to one another and communicate the same truth. Is that confusing? It, it's, it's really easier to understand if, if you see it written down. But here's a short chiasm that we all know that we use today that may kind of help you understand what I'm saying. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Okay, y'all heard that before? Everybody familiar with that? Okay, point A is going. Point B gets C, tough. Then flip it. C, tough. B gets A, going. See what we're saying here? They communicate, they correspond with one another and communicate the same truths. They parallel. And why is that? Well, again, it's for the sake of easy memorization. Because if you learn it one way, you understand it the other way. Um, so, with that being said, how does this section break down? Where's the chiasm? And I'll show you this, and if you're taking notes and want to write it down or punch it in your phone or whatever, uh, point A is verses 20 and 21, which is a question by the Pharisees. Point B is 22 through 25, which says, Son of Man revealed. Point C, 26 and 27, as in the days of Noah. So you can just write days of Noah. And then, so now we're going back down the other way. Point C, 28 and 29, as in the days of Lot. Then there's another B, which is verse 30, son of man revealed. And then we end on A, which is verse 37, a question by the disciples. So you have a question by the Pharisees, question by the disciples. Then you have son of man revealed, son of man revealed. And then you have days of Noah, days of Lot. So I hope that makes sense to you uh, because this is a chiastic structure. And the chiasm we're looking at really focuses around two questions. Um, that are asked to Jesus. And one is by the Pharisees, and the other is by the disciples, which are, which are our point A. And both of these questions deal with um, when, when and where his kingdom would be realized. You see, in Matthew 21, Jesus is speaking to these chief priests and these elders in the temple, and he says this in verse 43. He says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a people producing its fruits. So what we see is that in Matthew 21, it answers the what. It answers the what are we talking about. We're talking about the kingdom of God being taken away and giving to people bearing fruit. Well, if that's the what, 
Luke 17, our text this morning, answers the when and the where. You see, this kingdom is to be taken from the Jews and given to another people. Well, when and where will this happen? Well, let's examine our text this morning, and we will begin to answer these questions. So if you would, please stand with me, and let's read Luke 17, verses 20 through 25. And the Word of God says, Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say, Look there, or look here. Do not go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Let's pray. Lord, this morning we pray simply, God, as always, that you would help us to understand what you're saying here. God, nobody needs to hear from me this morning. We all need to hear from you. And so we just pray again that you would reveal your truth to us. God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and may you get all the glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So last week, you may recall that our text began uh, by telling us that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and, and that he was between Samaria and Galilee. And then he healed these 10 leprous guys, right? These 10 lepers. Well, our text picks up today right after that. And it doesn't tell us specifically where he is. So we may not actually know that yet. But what we do see is that immediately he has an audience with the Pharisees again. So it says there in uh, verse 21, being asked by the Pharisees. And, and what do they ask? Well, being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. So what we see is they begin this dialogue with Jesus inquiring about his kingdom or the kingdom of God. And they ask the question, when? When is this kingdom going to be here? So what this tells us is the, these Pharisees were aware that there was a kingdom, right? And, and we need to understand that because the kingdom of God, this wasn't just a New Testament concept. Um, now, last year, I touched on this when I preached on Luke 9, um, but the idea of kingship is literally found from cover to cover in this book. From the very beginning to the very end, we see this theme of kingship. And, and what we know is that during the time of Jesus, there were a lot of mixed opinions about the kingdom of God and the Messiah and what all this would look like, uh, what all the kingdom would entail. So whether they believed Jesus truly was the, the Messiah, this messianic figure, or not, whether they believed that he was going to come in with armies and liberate them from the Romans, because a lot of people believe that, we don't know. They could have been being facetious here about his kingdom. The text doesn't tell us, but whatever the case may be, whatever they think, whatever they're asking, um, they understood there was a kingdom of God. And we see this all throughout the New Testament, or the Gospels, I'm sorry. Jesus is running around everywhere preaching the kingdom of God. It's all over the place. And so the Pharisees are aware of that. And we see them ask here, when is it coming? That's the point of the question. Jesus, when is this kingdom you're running around telling everybody about? When's it going to be here? And look at how he answers them at the end of 20 and then into 21. He says, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So what's Jesus saying here? He's saying you can't see it physically. It's invisible. Now, one thing we know to be true about these Pharisees, what were they always wanting? They were wanting to see something. They were wanting to see a sign. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago with the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, he's like, if you raise somebody from the dead, he'll believe. Show them something, right? And that was normal for the Pharisees. They were always wanting to see something. Well, here, they want to see this kingdom. They're looking for it. And what does Jesus say? You can't see it. You can't see it. And they should have known this. In the book of Daniel... In Daniel chapter 2, we find Daniel interpreting a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And essentially what he tells him, it's this dream about these four kingdoms and all this stuff's going on. And Daniel interprets it and he tells him that during the time of the fourth kingdom that you're dreaming about, which, I mean, I don't even know if anybody disputes that the fourth kingdom is Rome. Maybe they do. I don't know. I take the fourth kingdom to mean Rome. And he says this in verse 44. In the days of those kings, what kings? The Roman ones. Okay? During the time of Roman rule, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these other kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. 
So what's Daniel saying? During the time of Roman rule, God is going to establish a kingdom that lasts forever. You know what that sounds like? The kingdom of God. Fair enough. Well, in Daniel 2, he also likens this kingdom. He compares it to a stone that would strike all these other kingdoms and break them to pieces. And it says that this stone or this kingdom would become a mountain that fills the whole earth. Well, listen to where the stone comes from in Daniel 2, verse 34. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. If you were in your Bible, I'd say circle that. No human hand. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. So this kingdom that is coming, this kingdom of God, is not made by human hands. Uh, In other words, this kingdom that would be established during the time of Rome would be a spiritual kingdom. It's not physical. It's the kingdom of God. It's spiritual. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying here to these Pharisees. He's saying, my kingdom's not coming in a physical sense. I'm not going to raise up a physical army and come in with swords and shields uh, conquering my enemies. This kingdom is a spiritual reality, and you won't even be able to see it. As a matter of of fact, it's already here in part, and you can't see it now. He says there, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, present tense. It's here now. Now, we need to do work with this because Jesus isn't merely saying here that the kingdom's just hanging out. Uh, That's that's not what he's communicating, because although uh, Jesus himself ushered in the kingdom, and he is the king of the kingdom... There is a sense in which by His very presence, yes, the kingdom is in their midst. But that's not at the heart of what He's saying here in this verse. The Greek word He uses for midst is entos, and it means within or inside. It's internal. So coupled with that word for you, um, this could and I think should be translated, the kingdom of God is within, or the kingdom of God is inside you. Okay, And contextually, that's a better fit because Jesus is making a contrast here. Um, He's saying this kingdom can't be seen. Well, why can't I see it? Because it's internal. It's within you. It's not an external kingdom. I'm reminded reading through this of Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. Um, If you remember Nicodemus in John 3, he comes to him during the nighttime. We we call him Nick at night. Okay, So he comes to him at nighttime, and and Jesus told Nicodemus, unless one is born again, what? He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now that word see doesn't have to necessitate physical sight. That's not what Jesus is saying. It can also mean perceive, to know, or to experience. So Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again or born from above, you cannot perceive, you cannot know, or you cannot experience the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because Daniel 2. This kingdom was cut without human hands. It's a spiritual kingdom. And we need a spiritual work to be given entrance into it. Jesus wasn't telling Nicodemus that he needed to be physically born again. He was saying, in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to experience this, in order to perceive it, he needed a spiritual birth. Or in other words, we may say he needed to be given spiritual life. Now, if you're in Colossians 2, you got that mark. Go ahead and flip over there real quick. And I want to show you something from Colossians 2, verses 11 through 13 which read this way. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made, how? Without hands. Circumcision made without hands. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So, in order to be added to this to Daniel 2's kingdom, the kingdom of God that was cut without human hands, Nicodemus needed, and we need today, a circumcision or a baptism without hands, without human hands. And how does Paul describe this cutting there in verse 13? He describes it as passing from death to life. You know what that sounds a lot like? Being born again. Being given spiritual life. And this being born again is completely an act of sovereign grace by a merciful God. Now, back to Luke. 
Jesus' point, which I hope that I've made clear, is that this kingdom, the kingdom of God, is internal. He said in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And watch this. We will come to him and make our home with him. So the promise of the new covenant kingdom, ultimately, is that God rules within and among his people. That's the kingdom of God. And that's essentially what he's telling them here. They're expecting him to come rolling in one day with a squad of soldiers and start mowing down Romans. But Jesus is saying, no, it's not that kind of kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. You can't even see this one. And one other thing he says before we keep moving is he tells them, or when he tells them it's in the midst of you, or or we understand it to mean within you, He isn't telling the Pharisees themselves that they're actually a part of this kingdom. He's just telling them the nature of the kingdom. He's saying it's it's internal. This is within. So we don't need to mess that up. But at this point, he's spoken to the Pharisees, and now he shifts the conversation to the disciples. And look at verse 22. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. So he's basically saying, just like these Pharisees are asking when, you're, when they're going to see the kingdom of God, the days are coming when you are going to be longing to see me. You see, he uses that messianic title that we see all through the Bible, Son of Man. And he uses that for himself here. He's calling himself the Son of Man. Now, the question we got to ask is, why would a time be coming for the disciples when they would be looking for the Son of Man, when they would be looking for Jesus? Uh, Why does that make any sense? Well, simply put, persecution. Uh, That's the answer. Persecution was coming for them. And what do we see? What do we see after Jesus ascends? All throughout the New Testament, the Jews were constantly trying to stamp out the church. They were heavily persecuted. And this is what Jesus is telling them is coming. But Josh, in here Wednesday night, he touched on this with, remember when they stoned Stephen? And uh, Paul and the boys are, are basically hunting down Christians just trying to eradicate them. This is heavy persecution language, and this goes on for years. But then, in 64 AD, um, history records for us that things really took a turn for the worse. Um, Whenever uh, there was a really bad fire that broke out in Rome, and it burned for six days and seven nights, and it burnt down three-quarters of the city. So this fire was huge. And the Romans blamed Emperor Nero. He was the ruler at the time, and they blamed him for it. So what did Nero do? Well, he blame-shifted and said, no, I didn't do it. The Christians did. He blamed the church, and he put the blame on, on them, and everybody believed him. And so history records that they were heavily, heavily persecuted by Rome after this point. Um, Nero did all kinds of wicked things to these um, first century Christians. For example, Nero would have them covered in animal skins and ripped apart by dogs um, alive. Many of you know that tradition tells us Peter was crucified upside down. Um, Well, this is believed to have happened under Nero, under his leadership. And the reason Peter was crucified to begin with is because Nero was crucifying Christians left and right. I mean, this was normal for them. They were killing them and crucifying them all over the place. Now, to that point, In a few months, we'll be celebrating um, the 4th of July. And one of the more common fireworks that we shoot during this time is a Roman candle. Y'all are familiar with it. If it's not shooting, you shake it, right? Then it'll work. We know what a Roman candle is. Well, do you know where the name for the Roman candle originated? Under the persecution of Nero that we're talking about this morning. According to the writings of Tacitus, and I may be saying that wrong, um, but he writes for us, records for us, that Nero would either have the Christians tied up or crucified... Um, and then he would cover or have them covered in pitch, oil, wax, and other flammable materials before lighting them on fire while they were still alive and using them as human candles. He would use them as torches to light his formal dinner parties and things like that. So this was absolutely awful. Awful. Nero was a wicked man, and if you do much reading about him, if you dig into this, you will find that this guy was nuts. I mean, he was completely insane. But this is what Jesus is talking about here when he says the disciples would be looking for the Son of Man. A day was coming in their future when they would be looking for their Savior to vindicate them, to get them out of this evil and this persecution that they would have to endure at the hands of both the Jews and the Romans. And notice, too, his emphasis is is that those who were currently among his disciples were those that would be looking for him. And his... uh, They would be looking for him in this physical kingdom, right? Just like the Pharisees were. So to try to twist this text and to make this audience somewhere 2,000 years in the future 
It's blatant scriptural abuse, in my opinion. He is talking to the disciples here. The text makes that clear in verse 22, and it becomes even more clear in verse 23. Look at 23. And they will say to you, to who, Christians, 2,000 years from now? No. They will say to you, look there or look here, do not go out or follow them. So he's saying a time is coming when you, the disciples I'm currently speaking to, in you know early 30-ish A.D., you're going to be looking for me. And these people, they are going to try to tell you, look over here and look over there. Now, were, were any of us standing there 2,000 years ago when Jesus spoke these words? No, we were not. So I think it's pretty clear that, this, that the there that he's speaking to is the first century disciples, not us. But let's keep going with the text because it says, they will say to you. Well, who are the they? According to the text, the they, these people, are people who are misleading people um, about where the kingdom of God is. This would make the they in the text false prophets, false teachers, false messiahs, etc. Jesus is telling these disciples, people are going to come that say, here I am or there I am, but they are leading you astray. Don't listen to them. And how come? Well, because back to verse 22, you won't see it. It's not physical. It, they're not going to see this kingdom. They're not going to perceive it. Um, Jesus is saying that this isn't going to be a physical kingdom, which is exactly what he just told the Pharisees. So whenever people start going around claiming to be the Messiah, don't believe them. Don't follow them. And how funny is it that today we see the same stuff? People pop up all over the time claiming to be Jesus reincarnate. And people also, you know, look at the blood moons and say the end is near and all these things. People have been crying wolf for 2,000 years and they're going to keep doing it. But Jesus told them and by implication to us, don't believe them, okay? They're liars. Don't believe them. In Luke 21, 8, Jesus said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Don't go after them. You see, false Christs were going to come, and Jesus is warning the disciples now. When they come, don't take the bait. Don't believe them. And now we get into the thick of it, so to speak, because Jesus um, makes another contrast. He's saying, don't listen to these false prophets, these false messiahs about my coming, like they have this secret knowledge or this special revelation, right? And then look at what he says in verse 24. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Well, what's the clear contrast? You're not going to have to wonder about my day because when it comes, it's going to be clear as day. That's what he's saying in verse 24. Now, this, this isn't a hill that I'm willing to die on because I don't think um, this understanding I'm about to give you really changes the meaning of the text too much. Um, but I do think there's a better way to translate verse 24. And I'm going to, you know me, I'm going to give you my argument. I always do. So this word that's translated as lightning can also speak, it can be translated, speaking of a shining lamp or a bright light. Um, and I think bright light is a better fit here than lightning. Further, furthermore, the word he uses for flashes is all over the Bible, and it's oftentimes translated as shines. So, for example, John 1.5 says the light shines, same word, in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So coupling these two things, we could read verse 24 this way. For as the bright light shines and lights up the sky. Fair enough? Okay. Do we know of any certain bright light that shines and lights up our sky? The sun. Okay? Let's keep going. Because I think that's a better fit. I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. And one common objection I found in studying this that people will object to for this is they'll say, Well, if Jesus wanted to say sun or sunlight, Luke would have just used that Greek word. But that isn't really a good argument. I don't think that dog will hunt, and I'll tell you why. Because you and I do the same thing all the time. So if I'm telling you a story about Samuel, my son, I may call him my kid or my boy, my child, right? But I'm talking about the same person. They're different words to describe the same object. So why does Luke have to use the specific Greek word for son to be talking about the son? That doesn't make any sense at all. Furthermore, in Matthew's parallel of this verse, which is Matthew 24, 27, it reads this way. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So let's change estrape, that's the, the word for lightning. Let's change that to bright light again and listen to this, thinking about the sun. For as the bright light comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
So Jesus is comparing the, the coming of this bright light as coming from the east. I don't know how old I was when I learned this, but I think as far back as I can remember, I have known that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Um, so what he's saying here is this bright light comes from the east. I think it's a picture of the sun. The sun comes from the east. The sun lights up the sky. And those Greek words can be used for bright lights. I think that's what he's talking about here. He's comparing the coming, this coming, his coming, to the sun lighting up the sky. Now, does this demand that when he comes, the sky would literally light up like the sky? No, it does not demand that. His point isn't that the literal sky will literally be lit up at his coming, but that just like if we were to walk outside right now, we would know by the sun being up that it's daytime. It, right? That's, everybody gets that. If we walk outside, the sun's up, we know it's daytime. He's saying that they're going to know he has come. And we'll tackle that more next week because in verse 37, he tells them exactly how they're going to know. Exactly. I mean, you could put a big circle around it. He tells them exactly how they're going to know. But let's talk about some of these implications of what Jesus is saying here. And we're going in rapid fire mode, so if you're taking notes, get your, get your pen ready. Um, but he is essentially comparing his coming to the dawn of a new day. That's what he's talking about. This, the bright light coming from the east. It's rising from the east and shining. So it's like or it's comparable to that. Well, when the sun comes from the east, what does that signify for us? It's, it's daytime, right? A new day has come. The sun is rising. Okay. Well, in Romans 13, 11 and 12, Paul said... Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So Paul says the day is at hand. And then he says, So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The day is at hand. Let's put on the armor of light. What does at hand mean? It means it's near. It means it's close. It's soon. Okay, Peter, in 2 Peter 1, verse 19, said, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention to, as a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Well, what is the morning star that Peter's talking about? What, is, what does morning star mean? Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So these New Testament writers were anticipating a coming day when Christ, the bright morning star, would rise. And they said this day was at hand. It was near. It was soon. This would dawn a new day and it would usher in a change. That's what they're all looking forward to. This day, this new dawn, would bring in a change. Well, this begs the question, how so? What change are they talking about? Because let's be honest, this symbolic language can be confusing. Like, what on earth are they talking about with the dawning of a new day? Well, in the New Testament writers' minds, what do they think is getting ready to change? What, what is at hand, as Paul said? So let's answer that question. Because if you're still in Colossians 2... Right after the verses we read, Paul gives us a hint. In Colossians 2, 16 and 17, he says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These, all these things, are only a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, where do we find regulations on food, drink, festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths? In the Old Covenant. In the Old Covenant. Paul says that all these Old Covenant rituals and regulations, all these things they were bound to by the law, they were all only a shadow of the things that were to come in Christ. That Christ was the fulfillment of. Christ was, Christ was the substance of the shadow. And the author of Hebrews apparently held to this line of reasoning too. Because in Hebrews 8.5, in, in Hebrews 8.5 he's speaking about the priesthood, the priests of Israel. And he says they, the priesthood, serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Hebrews 10.1, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Okay. So between Paul and the author of Hebrews, let's put this together. 
we can conclude that these regulations on food, drink, festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, as well as the priesthood and the entire Old Covenant law, all are a shadow of what's to come. They are all a shadow of the substance which is Christ, the bright morning star. And all of this language here is Old Covenant language. It's all pointed back to the Old Covenant. And Hebrews, if there was any dispute about that, you say, well, no, I don't think that's what he's talking about. Hebrews 8, verse 6, makes this crystal clear. He says, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. So in contrast to the old covenant, the shadow, Christ is mediating a better covenant, the substance. And look what he says of this covenant contrast between old and new in Hebrews 8, 13. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one, the old one, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete, so it's not obsolete yet, but it's becoming obsolete, it's growing old and ready to vanish away. So soon, this old covenant or this shadow is getting ready to become obsolete and vanish away. That's what they're all pointing to. And this would come to pass just a few years later when this new day dawned. When the Lord Jesus returned in judgment against Jerusalem and the old covenant system was completely destroyed. This is what Jesus is pointing them to in Luke 17, 24, when he's using this imagery of this bright light shining and lighting up the sky from one side to the other, from the east to the west. This is to signify him coming in his day. Now, I know that's a lot to take in, and, and we're going to most likely go back over some of that next week. Um, but this theme of Christ as the sunrise, it's literally all over the place. This theme of Christ as the sunrise and the new day, um, it's everywhere. So if you flip back to Luke 1 real quick, turn over there with me, Luke 1. Okay, verses 76 through 79. And um, keep in mind that this is being spoken of by Zechariah to his son John the Baptist. It says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of God, listen, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. Well, who's the sunrise there in Luke 1? Jesus. Furthermore, even in the Old Testament, Malachi 4, verse 2, we see this. Malachi 4, 2 says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Now that's the word Son, S-U-N. Son, the Son of Righteousness. And the text says that when it rises, it will bring healing. Okay? Turn to Revelation 22 with me. That's the last chapter in your Bible. And I want you to hold on to that. Hold on to that picture um, of the healing that the sun brings when it rises, okay? Revelation 22. And after this, I won't make you turn anywhere else, okay? It's a Bible drill this morning. Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Keep in mind that healing that we talked about with the sun, okay? It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also, on either side of the river, the tree of life. Okay. So John, I believe, sees the Godhead here. I think that's what he's looking at in verse 1. So if you remember in John 7, um, Jesus, it was the last day of the Feast of Booze, and he stood up and cried out, and he was telling these people about this living water. And he's telling them, if you'll come to me, like you'll, you'll get a drink. And the text explicitly tells us in John 7, 39 that he said this talking about the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the living water. Jesus said that in John 7, 39. Well, here, John sees a river of life, okay? And it's coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. So I think what he sees here is the Godhead. He sees, um, he sees the throne of God and the Lamb and the Holy Spirit coming from the throne. Fair enough? It's the river uh, of life, this living water. Then it says he sees fruit-bearing trees on either side of the river. And notice what its leaves are for there at the end of verse 2. It says, With its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing 
of the nations. Remember healing? We just talked about that from Malachi. Okay. What I'm suggesting this morning is what we have in Revelation 22 is a picture of God empowering these two trees. And they're on either side of the river, on either side of the Spirit. Okay? And it says the trees have 12 fruits. So think about this imagery here. We have 12 fruits on that side of the river and 12 fruits on this side of the river. So we've got 12 and 12. You with me? Okay, remember a few weeks ago whenever we were talking about the law, and how rather, how the law and the prophets represented Old Covenant Israel, how they were symbolic of the Old Covenant. Well, guess how many tribes of Israel there were? Twelve. And guess how many apostles there were in the New Testament? Twelve. Okay, listen to Paul here in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 21. Listen to this. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So you're members of the church, listen, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So Paul says here that the church, this holy temple where God now dwells, was built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. So I take these two trees in Revelation 22 to represent that very thing. They are symbolic, representative of the church. They are two parts that represent what has been built on them, which is the church of God. And if if this sounds completely foreign to you, I want you to think about Psalm 1. And how many times have we heard Psalm 1? Probably a thousand. But listen to Psalm 1 with this understanding now that the trees in Revelation 22 represent the church. Okay, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So what do we see? This is a righteous man. Um... This man is blessed. This man loves God. He loves God's word. We get that? He's righteous. And how does David describe this righteous man in verse 3? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its seasons and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers and the wicked are not so. So in Revelation 22, we have the picture of God empowering these trees which are described the same way, the exact same language that David describes a righteous man in Psalm 1. They're planted by streams of water. They yield fruit and they have leaves that never never wither. What do the leaves say here? Or what does it say about the leaves? They're for the healing of the nations. This is a picture of the church. And think about this. Think about this picture of trees representing the church. What, is it, what does a tree need to survive? It needs sunlight. It needs water. It needs dirt. Okay? Well, what do these trees represent here? The church. Those among, who, those among mankind, rather, whom Christ has redeemed. Well, where does man come from? The dirt. Right? Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, And the man became a living creature. Man is from the dirt. So you've got a tree here representing a man from the dirt. He's planted beside a stream of living water. And what are we talking about here from Luke 17? Jesus representing the sun. He's ushering in a new day, driving out the darkness. Jesus brings the light. And if that's not good enough for you, look at Revelation 22 verse 4. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads, sorry, verse 5, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. What is pictured here is the church age. We are the trees who are empowered by God, whose leaves are fruit, bring about healing of the nations. And what do the nations need heal from? Sin. Sin. And how is anybody healed of sin? Well, we talked about this last week. It's through the gospel. It's faith in Christ. So as you and I, as Christ's church, as we go forth empowered by God, doing the good works that He has ordained for us to walk in before the foundations of the earth and heralding this glorious gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on behalf of sinners, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation are healed as God grants them faith and repentance. And that's the picture here. 
Now, another place that we see this imagery of this sun um, is in Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 and 14. And what we see in Joshua 10 is, is they're at battle, Israel's at war, and he prays to God. Joshua prays to God and God listens to him and God calls the sun to stand still in the sky for a full day. He literally stopped the sun. He just hung it up there. Now, this was a type of what we now experience in fullness in the new covenant with Christ. And here's why. Because every day with him is a day that we are no longer, um, sorry, that we are without darkness. We are no longer under the guilt of our sin and shame. You and I have been brought into the light. See, in this story of Joshua, this, the sun standing still was symbolic that God was giving the Amorites into their hands. Essentially, that God was fighting for and defending His chosen people. You see, if the Lord was on their side, nobody could stand against them. Nobody was going to defeat them. Well, what did Christ say about His own church in Matthew 16? I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And why is that? It's because the sun is up. And God is fighting for us, church. And all these blessings that we've talked about this morning are the new covenant promises. And Jesus is connecting the dots for us using this imagery here in Luke 17. He's telling the disciples, when I come again, I'm lighting up the sky in a spiritual sense forever. And he goes on to say in verse 25, sorry, let me get back to Luke. Still in Revelation. He says, but first, before these things, but first... He must suffer many things and be rejected by who? This generation. It's no secret what Jesus is pointing to here. It wouldn't be long after, after he said these very words that he would be arrested, falsely tried, and crucified. Condemned to die on a Roman cross. And even in that, even in Christ's death, there is foreshadowing. Because the Son of God was raised up into the sky on that tree to bear the sins of his people to defeat the eternal darkness for all who would believe. And just as the Son of God was raised to die, the Son of Righteousness would rise again to bring new life. And that's the good news this morning, church. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, can stand fully in the presence of God with not an inkling of stain or sin. There is no shadow of our lives. There is no condemnation that God hangs over our heads as believers because the Son has driven the shadow away. We are forgiven. We are reconciled. And that's because Christ Jesus has brought us into the light. John 1 verses 4 and 5 said, In Him, in who? In Jesus. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We as believers are citizens of the kingdom of God today. You and I are citizens of, the, of this uh, new city, the new Jerusalem. And according to Revelation 21, there is no night in this city because the glory of God is its light. If, if you're an unbeliever, you need to know that the gates to this city are open. But according to verse 27, nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And what did, what did we discuss? If nothing unclean is allowed to enter, what did we talk about last week? How is one made clean? It's through faith in Christ and faith alone. This King of our kingdom who gave His life a ransom for many to pay for sin's penalty. The question is, will we turn from our sin this morning and follow Him? Will we look into the city and see the warmth of God radiating among His people and desire that same warmth in our life, or will we reject Him? You see, heat affects different materials in different ways. Heat melts wax, but it hardens clay. So what is your heart made of this morning? And this is a huge question because the same light that brings warmth and comfort to the believer is also brings forth the same heat and hellfire to all those who reject Christ. So the message is simple. Repent and place your faith in Him alone this morning and you will be saved. So with that, next week we're going to pick up in verse 26 and we're going to finish up chapter 17. So with that, if you would, would you please stand?